Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dependent on where you are in the world. Welcome to um, this part of the Women Leaders in Global Health Conference. My name is Adelo Nyango. I am coming to you from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a Kenyan media personality and the founder of the Adelo Nyango Initiative. So what we do is work with equipping youth with skills necessary for the job market and working with survivors of sexual violence to give them access to free therapy. So my work in the gender space has always wanted, um, has always made me want to have what I call a cultural audit. So to really understand if there are some practices that either aggravate or alleviate the gender issues that we're experiencing either as a community, as a country, and since the focus is on Africa today in the conference as a continent. So the panel we're about to dive into is about being silent no more, breaking taboos on gender, sex, and health. Um, I'm going to go into when you who's watching from wherever you are in the world can ask our wonderful panelists questions, but first you need to get to know them. So first I'll start with Jaha Dukure. Um, really glad to have you here on this panel. She's a women's rights activist and anti-FGM campaigner. She was in 2018 um, appointed as the regional UN Women Ambassador for Africa. And she's also a survivor of FGM and was forced into child marriage at the age of 15. And she dedicates her efforts and does amazing work in supporting the UN Women's Advocacy to End FGM and Child Marriage in Africa. She's also the CEO and founder of the NGO Safe Hands for Girls that provides support to African women and girls who are survivors as well of FGM. And through that, she has contributed to the Gambian government's ban on FGM, which is wonderful work. I'm so thankful for the work that you do, Jaha, and I'm so thankful to have you on the panel today. The next panelist that we do have is Barbara Kemigisa, she's a motivational speaker and activist, um, and she is from Uganda. She's living with HIV, and as a victim of sexual abuse, teenage pregnancy, and rejection, she's one of the people that I can't wait to hear from in this conversation because she uses her story to inspire, mentor, and engage children and youth infected and vulnerable to HIV to create a safe and healthy and empowered generation. Definitely the type of people that we want to have in this conversation. I also found it very interesting, Barbara, that you are the founder of Pill Power Uganda, which is an organization that enables vulnerable children and youth to enjoy a safe and friendly environment. And one of the focuses of your organization is on recycling. And your recycling drive has been adopted by six youth groups in Uganda. Um, hence reducing the dangers of plastic ARV bottles to the environment. Thank you for the work you do, Barbara, and I'm so glad to have you on the panel today. The next panelist could very well be my neighbor <laughs> because she's from right here in Kenya, um, Alessandra Ogeta, who is a trans activist and director of programs of Jinsiangu. And she's work in, working in Kenya at, as the director of programs for that organization, which was formed in 2012 to increase safe spaces and enhance the well being of Kenyan intersex, transgender, and gender non conforming people. I must personally commend her for the work that she does because her initiatives have resulted in gains for the transgender community, including the ability to change particulars in national identity cards and passports. So Alessandra, thank you so much for being here and for the work that you do. Another person who could very well be my neighbor, <laughs> you could be um, streaming from the apartment below, is um, Kennedy Ombima, who we know as King Kaka. He is one of the top rappers on the continent from right here in Kenya. And he's also a mental hygiene and management activist. He's um, very well known in the hip hop scene as a songwriter, a video director, executive producer, and an entrepreneur as well. I'm thankful for the work he does in raising awareness on the urgent need to improve the menstrual health of young Kenyan girls and going the, the further extent to keep them in school. 
He has a campaign dubbed Bank on Me, which has benefited over 10,000 girls through combating menstruation-related absenteeism. He is also working to end period poverty and mentoring boys to become better male allies. Very thankful for the work that you do, for the music you produce and share with us, and that you're here on this panel today, Kinkaka. Last but definitely not least, um, I'd love to welcome Reddy Klabi, who's a journalist, moderator, and author. And she's very highly distinguished in South Africa in the world of journalism, radio, and TV. She's also a columnist and award-winning author and moderator. She has facilitated debates on international platforms, and she passionately tackles such important issues um, facing the globe and the continent from crime, corruption, foreign policy, education, politics, and community issues. And I love that she truly believes that journalism is a tool through which social justice can be achieved. Um, looking forward to hearing your thoughts a little later in the conversation. So as you can see, we have an amazing panel ahead of us, um, young Africans who are making such amazing change. And I'm really excited to get into this conversation. Wherever you are watching um, in the world, do know that you can send in your questions as you watch. And at the very end, if time allows, we will have a short Q&A with our panelists and they can answer the questions that you have for them. Where possible, as you send in your questions, please state which panelists your question is for. It might be easier to facilitate the Q&A session that way. So I want to start with Jaha first. And once again, thank you for the amazing work you do. Um, in pushing for the end of FGM, maybe you could speak towards building a community that supports the work you do, because some people may lack the courage to go against cultural norms. So in the work that you do, how did you build that community and encourage them to build that courage? I mean, I think um, the work that I do in the Gambia, for instance, is a youth-led movement. And it was important that the work wasn't about me, that young people felt ownership of the issue and people realized that the reason why we are doing this is for our people, it's for our community. And at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do. I think with everything um, that we do, it's about respect and we do it with a lot of respect and we do it with a lot of love. And I think when you have those two things, you can't go wrong. Because when you think about an issue like FGM, you have to realize that it's not that parents do it because they hate their kids. They do it because they think it's the right thing to do. So the way you build a community in a nutshell from the people whose minds you're trying to change to the people who you're trying to get to be your allies is to make your point, but make it in a very respectful manner and realize that these are not some barbarians that you're dealing with, or these are not some African, ignorant Africans that you're dealing with, but these are actually um, parents who believe that, you know, this has been around and is the only way to protect their daughters. So for me, yes, that's how we build a community around us. It's by being very mindful of the way we go about our approach and being very respectful in our approach as well. Yeah, I love that you bring um, up the, the, the issue of ownership. So if you are trying to help a community, it really helps to make sure the community owns what it is that you're doing and also understanding the context culturally of the people that you're trying to help. Why is this practice happening? And when you understand that and equip them with knowledge, it does actually help. Now, I know you've spoken openly about being a survivor of FGM yourself, and I would, I would love to hear more about what you've learned um, about the importance of centering the voices and experiences of survivors themselves in the work that people do on a community level, um, country level, and even continentally. So I think when it comes to, uh, especially issues like FGM, um, it's important to have women who have the lived experience to be the voice of that campaign. 
And the reason being is you cannot take away the lived experience that someone have and the authenticity that they bring to the campaign. It's something that no one else has. So at the end of the day, I think it's important that we give those women the platform to lead change, whether it's FGM, whether it's child marriage, whether it's sexual violence. But the problem in what we find is globally, women like me, people want to sensationalize our stories wherein they want to mm. hear us repeat what happened to us over and over and over again, rather than focusing on the change that we're bringing in our communities. Yes, I am a survivor of FGM, and that is what drives me to do this work. But it's not the reason why I'm good at what I do. So I think a lot of times the world forgets that, that I'm a person first. I've been through FGM, but in the media and in the development sector, they look at women like us as photo ops, wherein they mm. want to take our picture and um, they want to talk about what happened to us and they want us to be repeating that. And I got to a point where in, you know, I've already shared my story and people know that I've been through FGM. You can read that everywhere on the internet, but that's not who I am as a person, if that makes sense. It contributes a lot into why I do what I do. And because I know what it feels like, I don't want anyone else to have to go through that. But at the end of the day, I'm also so much more than that. And I think mm -hmm. people tend to forget that. And which is why you see that African-based organizations are not funded as enough. And you mm -hmm. see that it's harder for African-based organizations to um, get access to resources that other organizations might. Because at the end of the day, I don't think people see us as change makers. They see us as, you know, just our stories and what they are. Yes, I completely agree with you. And I hear what you're saying, even in the work around um, sexual violence for me, speaking out about surviving rape, you become almost like the poster child. And the conversation exactly. doesn't go into like, how do we actually solve this issue? Um, and even now, there's a force for more, more funding to go to African organizations. But sorry, you were saying something? Yeah, so what I'm saying is, is um, I totally agree with you. I mean, there's always a call for more funding to go into African-based organizations. But the problem is, globally, I mean, Africans, for I would say for centuries, they've, you, all you see is that poor African child on TV but it's mm. never an African actually bringing change or those stories being told. So it's important that people like you and I, we share that story and the fact that change is happening in our continent and change is not happening in our continent because of the big international NGOs. Change is happening because people like us are talking to our people. Mm. I, to I totally agree with you. Um, I would have loved to bring in Barbara, um, from Uganda at this point, but I don't know if you're on, Barbara. Yeah, yes, I, oh, um, there we go. Oh, hi. hi, how are you, Barbara? Once again, yes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really wanted to bring I'm so in good, uh, sorry, Mike. Okay. Yes, no, no worries, no worries. I wanted to bring you in now um, because you, you are a person who's using your voice and, and your life story to push for change. And, and I'd love us to dive into the work you do around ending HIV stigma. Some of the impacts of that, um, of that stigma can cause people living with HIV to discontinue treatment so that they can keep their status you know, a secret. But through Pill Power Uganda, you found an innovative and powerful way to combat stigma around HIV treatment specifically. So I would love to hear more about the initiative and, and, and why it has been so impactful. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Adele and everyone else watching. I'm so privileged to be on such a panel. Uh, first of all, when you test for HIV, you feel 
it's um it's something unexpected and you don't really know what's ahead you you're scared uh, you're not sure how the rest of the people around you are going to perceive it so you end up in your own little world and you feel you just have to go on because the doctor says the medicine is the only way you're going to have to move on to the next level so um on taking my medication, I I didn't feel like my life had changed in a certain way. I didn't feel sick. I didn't feel I was limited by the fact that I was HIV positive. Unfortunately, the rest of the community society expected me to feel as if I was limited. I was no longer able to do certain things on my own or my life had to change. So when I look at this ARV bottle, I felt like it is something that even us who are living with HIV would take like most of the people would get their pills and put them in something else to disguise the medicine or else mm -hmm. if you manage to take your medicine, you'd wake up in the wee hours of the night to to go dump this bottle, maybe in a pit latrine so that nobody really knows your little secret. But um, with time, after over 10 years of taking my ARVs very well, I, I got an HIV negative partner and I had an HIV negative child. So I realized all this was possible because of good adherence to my medication. I had done a lot of things and I thought if everybody else had an encouragement, an inspiration to keep taking their medication, if they had a reason to keep taking their medication, I wanted to give that reason. So I had to even tell my story a little more with the testimony of what treatment had done for me. So of course, the first product made out of the ARV bottles was um, a baby bed. At that time, I could not afford the bed for my son. And I just made the bed for him. I told my husband if he could make. So I would move around to different health facilities and collect the empty bottles, which were in dust beans. And it was easier for people to just get their pills from the bottle into a plastic bag. So I took advantage of the available bottles and there was the bed made. But surprisingly, whoever came to the house to visit, because it was a tiny house, they would see the bed and they thought it was amazing. So out mm. of that idea came the flavices, the um, lampshades and the chairs. So people started coming like to want to know more why I was using this. But I realized each person, there was more to life than just the, the actual purpose. We felt this bottle is just to keep my medicine after it's no longer useful. But here I was saying it can become a chair, it can become a flower, it can become something that you can use even after. So I relate that to daily life to everybody. We don't have to feel like we are not useful. If something everyone else has been shunning, has been ashamed of, can become useful, it means Every life needs an opportunity. Every life needs someone to believe in them. And that's how Pill Power has come up. And I'm happy that many young people have taken it on. And it's changing how people look at their medication. It's changing at how other people look at their medication. It's easy to start conversations around HIV with those pills. So it's such a huge and amazing experience for me. Wow. Even just listening to you telling us the story of how the organization came to be is so powerful. It's really a testament of centering voices, but also, as Jaha said earlier on, in a responsible manner and not in a way where you're sensationalizing somebody's story. Uh, Barbara, you know, I know we've come a long way since, you know, when HIV came out and there was a lack of information although we still have our work cut out for us, but we've, we've made a bit of strides. But part of this conference is focused on leadership, especially in the health field. So I was just wondering if you have any pointers um, for leaders in this space to understand about the way social norms and taboos, especially around gender, how those um, taboos and social norms affect um, health policies and progress in the space of HIV? Uh, well, um, I happen to live the capital city of Uganda and I'm now staying in the rural part of Uganda in Hoima, which has recently been made the oil city. But when I came here, I realized that um, 
people are still held down by the cultural norms, the traditional norms, like a woman cannot really speak up when we look at the education level is completely down. Like someone you expect to be joining high school is so not empowered. They cannot even express themselves anywhere. It becomes so hard to empower such a girl or a boy in a way that you expect them to, to, feel, to feel safe or healthy or empowered to speak about issues affecting them. I have visited a few health facilities and I realized that um, in these health facilities, you find a child, you'll find a teenager, you will find a mother, a grandparent. So I felt this wasn't right because it, shan it makes young girls all shun going to hospital to access facilities. Some of these have already become pregnant and we understand this will make them uncomfortable to go to a facility where you're going to find your elder sister or your parent or a neighbor because village mm. is so interconnected. So I felt there was so much to be done and I needed to start somewhere to get actually these young people to learn to speak up on their behalf. So I feel that we need women and men in their different leadership positions to, to take up bullets for the rest of the communities, for the vulnerable people. Like if they take up bullets, like we are saying this, for example, people who came up to speak about their HIV status. We had to face that discrimination. People have called us rotten avocados, walking dead bodies, sorts of names. But what we did, we've seen the stigma reduce, the stigma levels reduce. So I feel if every person in their different leadership capacities can diligently serve their communities. If we reduce the amount of corruption in our environment, we are still drinking very dirty water here in the village. And I have to take my medicine. And sometimes it is hard. Like, for example, me from the city, I look at dirty water as gross. I can't take that. But it's actually the water we use to cook food every day. So it affects me personally as someone who depends on drugs every day. It also affects how lifestyle moves on in the community. So we are trying to engage leaders. I actually created um, a community center here in the village where I am raising she ambassadors like um it's an action initiative group uh, where we are having community health action group, community safety action group, and community empowerment action group. These young people are, tax, are tasking young people, young uh, our leaders, to do something about our community, to do something about issues affecting them. If I cannot go to school, if a young girl cannot go to school, it means she will not be able to identify the key issues affecting her, her health, her sanitation, her um, opportunities in future. So I felt the one thing I had to do was to engage leaders and it is our role as leaders, regardless what level we at, to engage people that we feel are concerned. And it starts with our families. Families are poor at the reason young girls are actually not even stepping out. Boys are not even stepping out because the family feels there is nothing they can change about the situation. So to me, I felt like rural settings are totally left out and we have to maybe borrow from the city uh, ideas on how we can get people to step, to step out and have a voice and demand for things to change. And that's a huge problem because we lack role models, we lack mentors, we lack opportunities. And even when we get the opportunities, we don't have the capacity to take up these opportunities. Thank you so much, Barbara, for that. Um, I love that you talked about decentralizing development issues around health so that it's not only urban settings that kind of gets um, that development. We have to make sure it goes to each and every part of, of, of our countries. Um, I love the idea around she, the she ambassadors. I think it's very important to urge young people to hold the leaders accountable and get involved and really know what's happening in their countries because really the leaders work for you. <laughs> it's not how we've been, we've been conditioned to think. So thank you so much, Barbara. Um, I'd love to bring in Alessandra um, here. 
I, there we go. Um, Alessandra, first, thank you for being on this panel. Thank you for the amazing work that you do and the strides that you've made already. And, you know, I, I would want us to talk about, since the spotlight is on Africa, I mean, even where yes. there are countries that have taken certain important steps when it comes to women's rights and, and freedoms of um, the LGBT and related communities, those LGBT and related communities' rights seem to be consistently under threat, right? So even the important steps we take in women's rights don't really involve um, these communities. So I'd love you to tell me, how have you worked to change the narrative around trans people in, in Kenya? And, and what have been some of your very effective strategies because you've made some great strides Thank you so much, Adele, and thank you everyone for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here, and I'm very glad to share uh, what Kenya has been doing in, the, in terms of uh, trans advocacy and, 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 and issues all around. Um, I mean, I'll just go right into it. Effective strategies are very important um, to ensure that trans rights are very well articulated and well understood, especially contextually. I mean, when we look at advocacy, we, we have many, many, many strategies to employ, but we also have to understand that in different parts of the world, things work differently. So we can't, we can't just assume that whatever has worked in, in the States, whatever has worked in the UK, whatever that works in South Africa, whatever works in other parts of the country is the same, that is the same and that the same in, things can be um, um, employed. One main strategy that we have employed in Kenya is uh, the citizenship approach. Citizenship approach basically is looking at trans people as citizens of Kenya. And when you look at the citizenship approach is we're trying to identify as citizens of Kenya, and I'll speak as a Kenyan now, what are the needs, what are our issues? Of course, we all have access to healthcare. We all have access to, to associate freedoms of association. We all have uh, a lot of freedoms that we have as Kenyans only. So there's no issue, there's no separation of as a trans person in Kenya, one cannot access these particular services. What we're trying to say is as as, as Kenyans first, what are the services that we are able to access? And then why are we being denied those services? Why can trans people access those services? At the end of the day, we are seeking equality. We are not seeking special rights. We are seeking rights that every other Kenyan is able to seek. So when you, when you look at discrimination in the workplace, why is that happening? Right. When you look at discrimination in healthcare setting, why is that happening? When you look at uh, lack of administrative um, address, when 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 trans people require services that are are particular to name change or um, being enrolled in a, in a clinic, we look at those uh, challenges and we try to address those issues. Right. And so one of the main things that we've, we've, we've done is we conduct a lot of sensitization trainings. And here we're trying to um, educate um, policymakers, educate law enforcement, educate healthcare workers on the importance of, of, of understanding uh, trans identities and not creating a narrative where trans people don't feel welcome to go into hospitals because they're afraid of how they present and what their presentation might mean for them. Like, for example, if I, I present as female and my documents read male, then what does that mean? And so a lot of education is very important. Another strategy we've used is we've done a lot of contribution to bills. So if there's any bill that is being reviewed, whether it's the health bill, whether it's the education bill, we try to ensure that we're within those rooms and we are, we are contributing to those bills in a sense that, in a way that uh, we, are, we are at the table in terms of policy and that no bill is not passed without uh, trans issues being particularly addressed. Um, 
there's a lot of litigation that we do as well because sometimes even as we as we advocate and as we seek for our rights, sometimes they're just not met the right way. Some people sometimes some people just hold a power, a particular power that they are holding in a particular seat, and they feel like, you know what, this is not right with me, so I'm not going to assist the particular person who wants the service. And so in those cases, then we try to take the matter into the courts and see what the courts are saying about that. And most of the times where we've gone to court is we've seen that the courts have, have been to our favor, really, because there isn't anything that the administrator was seeing that was not really um, trying to, was, was denying us the service. Like there wasn't any reason that was given. And so for that reason, we've used a lot of um, um, a litigation to address those. And, and of course we've borrowed a lot from other countries and seeing what works. We've borrowed a lot from South Africa and to see what has, is in South Africa and what can be done contextually. So in a nutshell, those, those have been our advocacy strategies thus far. And we see that there's a lot of change and there's a lot of progress that has, that has happened. Uh, even within, within the recently, uh, the government of Kenya creating national guidelines that is going to effectively understand and address uh, matters transgender. The same that happened with intersex people as well, where for the first time intersex persons were also part of the, the census process and were counted and all this. So it's, it's, it's a step and we are seeing a lot of change. Um, and and all I can say that we are in a country that is very open and very sub very willing to learn and listen and understand issues and with 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 sensitizations and with trainings and and uh, creation of awareness campaigns within different platforms then there is a, a lot of information that is going outside so that people do not feel like what is this uh, new what is what is transgender what is intersex what does that mean and so that has really played a very important role in um, the success of the trans and intersex movement in Kenya. Yeah, and I, I mean, just listening to you speak, I, I, I must comment how intentional the strategies are. Um, <laughs> and, and also, and yes, oh yes, and also the focus on, on educating, because sometimes yeah. um, you, you're halfway into pushing some change and you realize the leader who's meant to push it has no understanding of the issue you're talking about. And so education yeah. is a really big key. And I think um, you actually explained what really we need to do more of as we go forward to see um, more change in the, in the space of, of, of fighting for, for inclusion for trans people and just access to everyday human rights, right? Um, yeah. I would also like to bring in um, King Kaka at this point. I don't know if I should call you Kennedy. King, I know you're with <laughs> your musician name, <laughs> your stage name, that is. But um, what, what, what I do have to say is it's, it's so great having um, a male ally who's very passionate about ending period poverty and, and helping sort out the issues around menstruation that we have in our country. And, and you really have used your platform and, and your, your popularity to shine a focus on this issue. Um, it's funny that we've had conversations, but I've never asked you what inspired you to shine the spotlight on this particular issue of period poverty. It's, it's a long story. So um, I've been working closely with, uh, with the UNICEF and the UN. So at some point, uh, we were sanctioned to go and open water points in the north side of Kenya. So we encountered uh, a, a young lady who was in primary school, who was secluded in some hut, and uh, she was uh, seated on sand because she was uh, undergoing her menses. And that really disturbed me. So when we came back to the city, together with my team, we sat down and asked ourselves, 
what, what, is that thing really happening um, in, in our current times? Um, what can we do with the influence that we have? And so we started the Bank on Me campaign. So initially when we started, the whole idea was just, because I, I, I'm raised in a three boys, family, a single mother. These are things my mom never talked about. Uh, maybe we had them about them uh, from our neighbors or some sort. So now I started learning about it, which is uh, shameful that I, I, at this particular age is when I'm, I, I was indulging in, in, in this particular information. So after a while, we, we thought instead of just working on it or from a paper point of view, let's go on ground. And we, and we did our first campaign. We, we distributed to 300, 300 girls uh, the place in Machakos just to see how the campaign would look like. Along the way, we have uh, changed so many things um, from what we've learned and the interaction that we've had. Uh, we've distributed to almost 30,000 girls who are in the program as we speak. Um, the main agenda for the program is empowerment. And empowerment means uh, if it's 30,000 girls, then the equivalent of that. Uh, so we've interacted with 30,000 girls and almost 30,000 boys where uh, we feel that this conversation is not purely meant for girls, also for boys. This empowerment uh, conversation and mentorship, because even the businesses that I run and um, interactions that I do, mentorship is a very big and vital uh, element on just passing information because uh, I was inspired to be who I am today. If if the motivational speaker did not come to my school when I was in, in primary school or high school, then I picked two or three or four elements from different people. So I said, what if we go to the interior as well and just, and just do the same? Uh, yes, the sanitary towels is a point of conversation, but along the way we've learned so much in terms of community leadership, who runs what, um, what's the notion and the mentality that they have. And um, just getting their point of view and adjusting to the program. So we've, we've run the program almost two years now, 30,000 girls are in the program. And we're very strict in terms of just um, communication. So for example, when we go to a certain school, we, we have to do reke. So first we go there to a certain region and mobilize a few schools and talk to the leaders, community leaders as well. So it's not purely just telling the girls to be in school or the boys. We're telling them the importance of being in school, why we're advocating for them to be in school. So when that is done, now we go and talk to community leaders and we ask what's really going on in, your, in our community, this particular community, what can we change and why we are pushing for education for the girls and boys. And then when we leave, we make sure that we are working closely with local youth-based organizations so that now we get information from school. And we have a special report card that girls go and pick sanitary towels from their schools and they sign against each and every entry. And at the end of the term, they have to enter their, their school results so that by the time we're doing an evaluation, when we come back and we ask them, um, now that you, we're making sure you're in school, and you're still not doing well, what's the issue? Is it, is it at home? If it's at home, what's the issue? So we have um, what's called like a blank paper sessions where we give the girls and boys and we ask them to frankly speak about what's going on in their home places and what they would like changed. And we've gathered so much data within the, thir the 30,000 girls and the uh, 25,000 boys. And so we, 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 we are still learning, and I'm, and I'm happy to be here on this platform. I'm, I'm learning from each and every speaker. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is a, this is something. I, I hear you. It's, 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 it's so inspiring. And, and even just hearing Alessandra, Barbara, and Jaha speak, it's like, oh, this can actually work um, e even for my community, or this can actually work for my program. So it's great to be on this panel together. Um, I love that two things about your organization in that um, there's, there's a focus on not only the lack of access to sunny, sanitary products. What does that mean for a girl? Does it mean that they can't, they stop going to school? So how do we also sort out that problem? 
and I love that it also involves boys, um, which we sometimes don't have those conversations. And I'd love to bring it in because we're looking at cultural practices. So I'd love to know your thoughts on, for example, some of the circumcision rituals for boys and the role it plays in framing, in the framing of masculinity and gender issues that end up um, affecting women's health, right? Uh, have, have you, in the work that you do and in your experience, have you seen um, something that you can see, okay, some of the rituals we take boys to actually do play a role? Yeah, most definitely. Because um, if you see, with as much as we would want, we would want to change the community and tell girls you need to go to school. We we are telling them as well that uh, we realized that in, in the in the beginning we we really did not involve the community leaders. We thought it would be easy. We go to our school. We tell them here we have sanitary towels and we talk to the girls and boys and we leave. Then, uh, after we collected most of the papers from the boys and girls, we noticed that like, like the, the community leaders really play a, a huge role. So now we started having meetings with them. And in the beginning, they would say, no, who are you? What do you want with our girls? Or what do you want with our boys? Uh, you want to change our culture? Because still, as much as they're learning the, easier, the easiest ways of doing things, when they go back home, they are still tied to the tradition. We're not saying tradition is bad, but there are, there are, there are easier ways of doing things and uh, modern ways of doing things. So now even new conversations would arise, like circumcision. Uh, do you feel like there's a there's because because we've had cases in Kenya where some of the the like two months ago there's a boy who died, uh, four months ago there's another boy who died. We've had so many girls cases where girls die, they bleed to death. So we are telling the community leaders, listen, uh, we understand that uh, this is your, is, your, is your tradition. What can we do differently? Or if, 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 if it's, can we eliminate this uh, totally? If it's the boys, yes, uh, the hospital. So now new conversations start to arise. Can we, can we partner up with, with organizations that can facilitate such, for, let's say for boys? Um, so now, like the community leaders really play a big role that we had to put them in our, in our communication systems. Yeah, yeah I totally, I, I can see how that would help. I do know, um, going back to FGM in Kenya, we have NICE um, who, who does a lot of advocacy to end FGM and she says you actually have to do engage community leaders, religious leaders in the community and then now the issue you're dealing with, start doing, as I call it, a cultural audit. What other rituals are we doing that could be either beneficial or could actually not be helping at all? Um, so thank you so much, King Kaka. I, I want us to go to South Africa and bring in Reddy at this point. Um, because, you know, is Reddy still on here? Yes, I'm absolutely here. I'm with you. Thanks. There we go. There we go. Um, and I, I wanted to bring you in because you've been really outspoken about ending gender inequality and something that I'm so passionate about, the politicization of gender violence. Um, so first, let's start off with movements that we've seen over the last couple of, of, of years, like hashtag yes, all women, hashtag me too. Um, have they shaped and, and, and how do you think these movements have shaped and influenced the conversation on gender inequality and the politicization of gender violence? Mm. Well, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Me Too movement has had a profound global impact. But I want us to just pause for just a second because when Me Too started making waves and resonating globally, I, as an African, felt, hold on, Africa has been here before. We have seen women, children speaking out, challenging the, challenging the power dynamics in politics, in education, academia, in activism even, in business even, but the world wasn't listening. And 
I suppose it does not help us to nitpick and say, um, you know, the world is galvanizing into action and being awakened into consciousness because Me Too originated in the United States. I think as we are activists and dealing with uh, universal and global issues that have a domestic and local impact, we are just glad when our voices are amplified wherever that happens. So it's not a competition between the global South and the global North when it comes to impact. But I think it is worth noting that there are many experiences that Africans have that are not being watched, that are not being listened to, that are not being spoken about. We are rendered invisible. And it is something that I call uh, knowledge inequality, that we do have common experiences. But in, instead of this pitting us against each other, I'm putting a positive spin on it. I'm simply saying there are these issues are not unique to Africa. They're not unique to the Western world. It simply happened that the genesis of this movement was in the United States and the world was listening, particularly because the powerful men that were being challenged and toppled were in Hollywood. And, and so, you know, the, the world was paying attention, but Africans and activists from the global south, I mean, I'm just thinking about India here in South Africa, that have some of the high rape statistics in the world. Uh, we've been t uh, talking about uh, debilitating cultural practices. And I'm just saying that those, those may be domestic issues, but they do have that universal uh, uh, resonance. So I, I just want us to be a bit more confident as Africans, that when we use case studies of movements that have shaped the world, yes, we, we, we must pay fidelity to facts. Me Too had that global resonance, but there are activists on the ground in the global south, there are community leaders, there are uh, policy makers, there are journalists on the ground that are making waves and shaping the narrative in their own communities. The world has to see us, the world has to uh, 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 listen to us. But hey, if it takes a hashtag in today's um, uh, uh, you know, tech world to get allies to listen, to get policymakers to listen, to make powerful men, powerful men, patriarchal men and uh, their allies, wherever they may be, if it takes a hashtag and a global uh, a catalyst to get them to listen, then I think we have all won. But I think what is important here is that we do need to shape the narrative. We do need to complicate the narrative. We do need to elevate and amplify voices from the global south. I heard some of the panelists and I really respect their lived experiences and, and, and the work that has shaped, uh, that shapes their lives. But we are not short of role models in, um, in, in Africa. We are not short of activists. We are not short of influential change makers. I think what we need to do is create platforms where that work is known, where the impact of that work, because the impact is there, where the impact of that work is known. I think that we need to do far more to create platforms. And I challenge my own sector, the media, we need to do far more to create platforms where we really demonstrate that the global South and Africa in particular has a lot to contribute to the global market of ideas. So just to summarize my answer to you, yes, these movements have been very important in that those who've been passive, those who have pretended that the problem of exclusion and abuse of women and children is not real, or those who believed that this particular oppression happens in poorer communities of the global South, they were awakened to the fact that power dynamics in all their toxicity can be found in some of the powerful corridors in the world, including Hollywood. Yeah, I completely, completely agree with you. It's that when you're working in that space, it for a while before Me Too, it felt like you were talking to a wall. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it's, it's oh, the wall is now listening. But when you look at what's happening in Namibia currently, what's happening in South Africa, still even using the hashtags, because the hashtags sometimes help me here. It kind of like makes me non-dependent on traditional media spaces to access what's happening with women when it comes to sexual violence in, in other African countries. I'm, I'm, I, I really want to high five you. I wish I was next to you because I, I completely agree with everything you say. Um, in terms of the media, you've spoken a bit on it, but maybe we can expound in how do we create safer spaces and what's the role of the media when it comes to actually setting a spotlight on issues around women's health, 
issues on sexual violence, how, what role does the media play, for example, in terms of even the language used, you know, um, that sometimes normalizes sexual violence in the stories that they put up? In, in your, what do you think, in your opinion, is, is the role of the media? What do they need to do? Hmm. Well, I can tell you this. If I had to relive my life all over, I probably wouldn't study journalism anymore. I would do critical thinking or gender studies, or if it is the environment that I want to specialize in, that's, that, that's what I would do. Why am I saying this? I, I feel that we train journalists to tell any story, to tell us what's happening in the news. But there's very little training that goes into hearing people's voices and finding out how they are affected by the political moment, by whatever event is happening in society right now. So if any of my daughters wanted to be a journalist, I'd say that's fantastic, but go and study economics, go and study gender theory, go and study uh, climate change and the environment, specialize in a particular area so that there is focus, there's a, sing a singular minded focus on, 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 on really interrogating the intersection of policy and politics. So I think that in the media, we need to complicate the, the narrative. We need to go beyond the headline. I live in a country that has the highest rape statistics in the world, but the coverage around rape I, I, I want us to be a little bit curious to say, we report on rape every single day. Why are we not changing the culture of men and our societies that protect rapists or that are not outraged enough when it comes to, uh, uh, to rape? So what am I saying to you? I'm saying that we report in the same way over and over again. And if the same thing keeps happening, then there's something about our reportage that is not making the impact that we wanted to make. We ought to design our coverage to have more depth, to have more substance and not be satisfied with having told the world what is happening in our communities if we come back the next day and we tell them the, next, the same thing and we come back next week, next year, we tell them the same thing. So I would like to see the media really going into the communities, assess how they are impacted by exclusion, by lack of access to reproductive rights, by oppressive cultural practices. I would like the media Again, in South Africa, during winter, we have the circumcision uh, period, which is not just a health issue, but also a cultural issue. And every single winter, we read headlines about young men who die at the hands of traditional uh, doctors who are performing uh, the, 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 these practices and circumcision in unhygienic environments. Every single year, parents are losing their children. People are losing their brothers. So instead of telling me that story over and over again, let's go to those communities. Let's sit with those traditional healers. Let's ask them how they reckon with the growing number of body bags of young men who had so much to live for, but are now dying at, at, at the hands of a cultural practice, but without disrespecting that culture, but call a spade a spade. Is it time to, 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 to jettison some of our antiquated cultural practices? Sometimes we are politically correct because we think that the West is judging us. It's not about the West. The activists are in our communities. The agency is in our community. The people who want the change are not the outside world looking at us backward Africans. Of course, that's an old and tired story. But I'm saying that when I had a radio show, it is the people in that communities who are saying, hold on, this culture no longer serves a purpose. Let's have that conversation our, ourselves. But I think that the media is not helping us build the bridge on which we can travel to each other's world. They're not helping to complicate the narrative. They're not really uh, uh, focusing, at least where I live, on, on the impact, the real impact and how lives are changed by, by, by what is happening in our society. So the media has a huge responsibility here. We have a huge responsibility to go to our communities. We have a huge responsibility to sometimes take the spotlight away from the politicians, away from our celebrities, but go into communities because that's where the lived experience is. That's where the change is really uh, is really happening. And I also think that the way we, we, we cover policy and budgeting, we need to put a gender prism on this. We need to say, here is the budget for social development. How many women are impacted on this? How many children are impacted on this? And what is the overall impact on a community? Because I think there's a way in which society doesn't see that when you impoverish women who, where I live, are the, 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 the 
you know, they, they support families. There's a high incident of single uh, mothers. There's a high incident of grandmothers who are raising their children. There's a high incident of migrant labor as women and men leave their children in rural South Africa to come and raise our children here in the urban areas. We ought to pause and think of how these communities are affected by what we have really normalized in society. And so when we design policy, we put that gender prism, but we not only put the gender prism, we bring the case studies from the villages and the communities so as to force policy. So I think the media should really have uh, an intentional focus on policy and practice and who's affected by it. And I think that's how you can galvanize and pressure and mobilize for change at the highest level. Thank you so much, Reddy. Such um, amazing points, um, not only for, I know you're speaking from an understanding of South Africa, but Africa, but also here in Kenya in terms of the media, it's the same thing we're seeing where 90% of the screen time or news time is given to politicians. And then maybe one, one story on, you know, sexual violence will make the news. Mm -hmm. And even then um, the reporting is done in a way where it's, either normalized or in a way where there's no actual understanding of the problem. So there needs, as you say, to be a step further in understanding the issue and understanding the effects the issue is having on the community at large. Um, so thank you so much. I just wanted to thank each and everyone on the panel from Jaha to Barbara to Alessandra to King Kaka and to you, Reddy. I've, personally learned so much. I'm, I'm very inspired. And as you said, ready about there not being enough role models, I think we've all gained quite a few role models from the panelists um, on this, on this, uh, in this panel. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much for being here today, for the work you do and for the insights that you've shared. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, rest of your evening, rest of your night, <laughs> depending you. on where exactly you are. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so thank much you. to you as well. Thanks Bye. indeed. And all the panelists, thank you for sharing your life story. Yeah.